Okay, welcome back from the networking break. Uh, again, uh, before we get started with the Nutrient Summit, I wanted to thank our gold sponsors, uh, Brown and Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Slayton, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jenks. Up next, we have Dave Clark and Haley Falconer. Dave Clark is a senior vice president and serves as HDR Engineering's marketing sector director for wastewater. He has more than 40 years consulting experience and currently leads strategic efforts in understanding wastewater regulatory uh, issues as they affect the wastewater utilities. Mr. Clark is the regulatory liaison for the Water Research Foundation Nutrient Research Program and the lead author on regulatory issues. He recently published a report on nutrient discharge permitting frameworks for the Water Research Foundation. Haley Falconer is the current PNCWA president and environmental division manager at the city of Boise. Uh, in this role, Ms. Falconer provides direction for the environmental and sustainability initiatives across the city. The environmental division serves as a resource for city operations, helping to advance in the areas of energy efficiency and energy production, smart building design, water management, and reduction and materials management. Dave and Haley, you're up. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh, David, let's go to uh, next slide. So I think first what we'd like to say is that uh, we know that this is a nutrient summit. So we are going to talk about nutrients, but maybe in a little bit different way than you might expect. So David, next slide. We don't want to look at nutrients in just one silo because even though our regulatory structures are often in silos, maybe organizationally we're in silos, uh, we have a, a more complicated operating environment than that. So next slide, David. So the title of our talk, Integrated Planning at the Intersection of Nutrients, Toxics, Unregulated Compounds, we want to consider all of those things in a holistic way. So next slide, David. So we know that utilities face this multiplicity of challenges and demands. So we have nutrients, we have toxics, unregulated compounds. We have some interesting human health criteria in the Northwest states developed over the last couple of years. It's not just nutrients, toxics, and unregulated compounds. It's also temperature. It's also things that are driven by climate change if receiving water quality is worse, if we have more challenging wet weather compliance issues. And then there's asset management because at the core, many of our facilities are old and we need to plan for renewal and replacement. So next slide, please. The good news is that we have some new tools and a part of the development here that provides new tools is that integrated planning was codified in the Clean Water Act last year. Now, how often does the Clean Water Act get amended? It's not very often. So this is a pretty big deal because integrated planning allows for local prioritization of all of the regulatory requirements. So nutrients, toxics, CSO, wet weather, and more. So we can also consider other things in the amendment. So interesting aspects of this, it's not an entirely new concept. In fact, EPA came out with a framework for integrated planning back approaching the 2012 presidential election. And the US Conference of Mayors, NACWA, and other water organizations supported this concept because there were so many regulatory requirements stacking upon each other. So in this amendment that's now codified in the Clean Water Act, we see that it explicitly provides for multiple permit cycles for compliance. It even allows for existing consent orders to be modified and it provides a new municipal ombudsman. So next slide, David. So in March, EPA named the first municipal ombudsman. So Jamie Pizzioli was appointed and her office has specific priorities to be an impartial resource on clean water programs to coordinate the regional EPA offices provide information on funding assistance, Clean Water Act flexibilities, and other integrated planning opportunities. So there's good stuff here in a new office of ombudsman to help promote integrated planning. Next slide. So we know that utilities need to balance multiple priorities. And at the base, we have to comply with our existing effluent requirements. Utilities have to manage growth in flows and loads. 
and we need to sustain our existing effluent management and biosolids programs. But there are competing demands and we know there are resource limitations and through all of that, we need to sustain compliance. So Haley, on the new requirements side, yeah, I think nutrients in a lot of ways ends up being maybe the tipping point or one of the first that we face, but many areas are also facing wet weather compliance. Certainly we're seeing more around toxics in the Northwest, temperature, unregulated compounds, and then what the, a utility needs to do around climate change planning and aging infrastructure. And then in a year like 2020, uh, something like COVID can come in and really reshape our, our whole lens of how we have to manage and none of these other requirements go away. But I think for today, kind of an important reminder that I, the gone are the days of a singular issue really being our focus. It's not only phosphorus or only nitrogen, but it's the complexity of many of these different requirements coming together and, and forcing us with these competing demands and the, the subsequent resource limitations. So Haley, do you have a comment about how you're managing these competing demands now? What's, what's going on within the utility? I think for us in, in Boise right now, I, I would like to say that we're at kind of a transition period where I think traditionally, and, and perhaps like many utilities, it's a bit reactive. We see new, um, new re regulations or requirements coming at us and we're reacting to those. And one of the first steps for us has really been to get all of these requirements out on the table and start to build a much more proactive approach. So that's something like, I mean, I, I guess I can't say COVID-19 wouldn't have shaken things up. It certainly would have. But if we get some unexpected stressor, we've, we've got enough proactive pieces in place to be able to continue to manage these requirements. So let's go on to the next slide. Really because of these varied and competing priorities, we're looking for projects that provide multiple benefits. And one of the ways that we can do that is identifying areas that have multiple benefits, looking for drivers that can be addressed together. So perhaps an unrelated topic at face value would be temperature, where we have three potential options for managing low effluent temperature limits. Uh, we could go straight to effluent cooling. Technologically, we know we can do that and we can achieve our endpoints, but without much in the way of environmental benefit and certainly with an environmental detriment from an energy use standpoint. And then we've got a couple of other options like the 316A variants, which is really a regulatory option or a regulatory solution. Or we could look at something like reuse where we're taking the water and we're putting it to beneficial reuse and we can start to see multiple benefits in some of these other categories where we're not strictly meeting a regulatory requirement, but now we've got an approach in reuse that could divert nutrients from the, the water, the surface water, and see those put to beneficial use through agricultural irrigation. Uh, we, can, we get water supply augmentation, and in some ways we're meeting community expectations. But through all of this, these aren't necessarily the easy solutions. There are regulatory overlays that are complex and differing, uh, whether we're putting water in surface water or to reuse. And we've got perhaps conflicting community acceptance on things like recycled water and where that should be used. And if we presume as a utility that we know what those benefits are and that they can overcome these known and unknown hurdles, we may run into issues. And so it's really important for us to find ways to connect with the community around these topics and highlight the value to the community and their expectations on addressing things like say temperature and nutrients together, but in a way that's really focused on what the outcome is. Next slide, please. So on that thread of multiple benefits, another example from San Francisco Bay, we've got a really innovative watershed permit but nutrients in this case has been a catalyst for seeking out some multiple benefits, including climate resiliency. So nutrient reduction by other means has become kind of a code word, a uh, set of words around things in San Francisco Bay to refer to effluent reuse and nature-based solutions. And the nature-based solution that's been featured a lot and there's a lot of interest about is the horizontal levy project at the Oro Loma Sanitary District. So this is a combination of nutrient polishing, sea level and shoreline restoration, and then habitat restoration around the bay. So multiple benefits. Next slide. So when we look at the environment, 
the water environment may be the same one that we view with different perspectives. On the engineering side, um, we look at what we need to achieve in terms of effluent performance. In engineering, we're really focused on reliability and redundancy, a certain conservatism. We want to plan for logical phasing. We want to avoid stranded assets. But Haley, on the utility management side, how are you viewing the same water challenges? Yeah, it, really, it does. It starts with compliance. That's mandatory. And in some ways, and depending on the community expectations, that might be the minimum, that there's compliance and reliability. And in many ways, those are taken for granted, but the expectations go from there. So in Boise, the expectation is protection and enhancement of the river, and that we're looking at and managing and considering unregulated compounds in our work. But at the same time, we've got this affordability overlay that we cannot um, forget and we have to bring to the center. And so we've got to find solutions where we're not overcapitalizing and we're utilizing the regulatory tools and framework and possibilities that we have to better expend our resources. And so you know, these things are in some ways new and different because of the multiple com competing demands that we're seeing. If you could, next slide, please. And so in Boise, we consistently hear that the river is the center point. This is uh, an area where our citizens, our community expects the city of Boise to be the vanguard of the river. And it's a top priority for the work that we do. And so our community is also not constrained, as I mentioned, by the regulatory requirements as that being our only target. And that considerations for other constituents or other opportunities are critical and that we should be keeping the water keeping our resources here locally. And one of the things that we found is that in finding a shared goal that our community, our city, our regulatory agencies and environmental groups can rally around, that can really shift the narrative. So the Boise River is something we can all agree upon. Um, while nutrient management is a part of that conversation, it's not the, the rallying cry that folks are going to come to the table and, and develop innovative solutions. But when we shift to watershed protection and river management, we really create opportunities there for innovation and for those solutions that provide multiple benefits. Next slide. So integrated planning is a way then that we can balance those engineering and technical perspectives with the utility management perspectives. And this new integrated planning tool allows us to balance with local prioritization, look at affordability, and use adaptive management to get smarter as we go. Haley? And from a utility management standpoint, there is a level of regulatory certainty that is important. But we also want to get to that point of being proactive, seeing what's coming, but also being able to meet these affordability expectations and, and extend our cash flow outlay so that we are doing things in the right time for the right reason. And that's going to be different for every community. That's really locally driven. And that's what is so intriguing and needed about integrated planning. Next slide. So here's a bit more on this uh, Clean Water Act amendment on integrated planning that the president signed last year. It allows for multiple permit cycles for compliance. And remember, it was a short time ago that we generally thought of a five-year NPDES permit cycle as being kind of the time limit to accomplish everything. And I think in the Northwest, we've broken through that in a number of locations. You see extended compliance schedules, for example, on the Spokane River. Now we have something that's codified in the Clean Water Act that says you can do exactly that. Again, you can modify potentially under some circumstances existing consent orders if they don't reflect the current priorities in a community. We have that new municipal ombudsman and integrated planning combines all of these requirements together. And the amendment actually, it specifically mentions combined sewer overflows, CMOM and collection systems, stormwater, wastewater, and water quality based effluent limits for TMDLs. So next slide. So we've got a couple of examples here that have been featured in the dialogue around the country as being reference points for integrated planning. And so big utilities like Johnson County, Kansas is in the Kansas City metro area, smaller utility I'll get to next in Columbia, Missouri. You know, we've got, we've got integrated plans that have received local support and have been accepted by the regulatory agencies. So a couple of things on Johnson County. The local prioritization was based upon environmental customer service 
and community enhancement criteria, kind of a complicated multi-criteria decision analysis for prioritization of a large program, so several hundred million dollars over a 25 year period. And interestingly, we've got this financial capacity consideration that's part of the decision making and planning the program over the extended period. Next slide, please. So in Columbia, Missouri, smaller community, the local prioritization was based on criteria for social, economic, and environmental criteria. And an interesting twist here that affordability included consideration of EPA's newly proposed financial capability assessment that includes a poverty indicator. So in Columbia, they were able to look specifically at some of the areas in the service that the customer base has a lower ability to pay. So this is a plan that received unanimous city council approval. It allows local control and it's incorporated in the permit. So next slide. So what we wanna look for are synergies between uh, the things that we have to do on the technical side, the utility management side, in order to develop new opportunities, to solve multiple problems, to get multiple benefits. On the engineering side, you know, we look at optimization. Maybe we're trying to reduce energy costs or improve effluent performance to reduce nutrients. Or find a technology convergence where something we do for nutrient removal provides reclaimed water for reuse. A chance to do some asset renewal if we modernize facilities and then maybe even work outside the fence line in these uh, nutrient reduction efforts by other means like in Oraloma. Haley? Yeah, and on the utility management side, it's certainly optimization and getting what we can out of our existing system, our existing assets. But then with something like regulatory flexibility and tools, some of the things that we're, um, we're aiming for, I guess we're negotiating right now is a combined load permit or a bubble permit where we can manage our system within that the potential in the future for trading, but having these uh, extended schedules of compliance and those regulatory flexibilities, we have to turn back then to the engineering side and really leverage that tool. We've, if we have time and we have some window to make different decisions or to try things out differently, that's really where we get to some of those better outcomes and hopefully get to a place where we're reducing the cost of compliance. Because without the time and without really taking advantage of, of time and flexibility that we gain through say a regulatory process, we run the risk of building it all right up front because that's what we need to do to meet compliance. And that's not getting us to the point where we've got a better outcome and a better solution for our community, for the river, for our ratepayers. Um, and really with that time, it's also looking for these new opportunities, which are often not the easiest thing. And they're, they're different and they're difficult and they take that upfront work. If you could go to the next slide, please. And so in Boise, our approach to phosphorus management will hopefully allow us to recognize both the regulatory flexibility and time where we've got our two water renewal facilities at West Boise and Lander Street uh, that are right now have secondary phosphorus removal and in the future we'll have tertiary, tertiary treatment. But we also have the Dixie Drain Phosphorus Removal Facility where we're treating and removing phosphorus from an agricultural return drain. But in order for that to work as a system locally here, very specific to Boise, we've got to have that, that flexibility in the regulatory structure. And the, then the choice and kind of the optimization comes into the utility. Where is it that we want to be removing, whether the least cost per pound of nutrients or where our staffing is optimized or maybe some Hiccup happens and we need to be able to shift that that's something that we can really do at the local level and still provide the watershed benefit, the nutrient removal benefit to the system. Next slide, please. And when we have these opportunities for innovation and for better solutions, those are important to leadership. I know Steve mentioned it from Columbia, Missouri related to their plan. And here in Boise as well, we recently had unanimous council approval and support for our long-term water renewal utility plan. But to have our city council pro tems when asked what the most important thing council will do this year, uh, state that it's the water renewal utility planning efforts, uh, that's pretty profound. And it's something that we can take as we move forward, any of us in our utilities and building these different and better solutions um, and really build on that example of leadership um, in a community that can support innovation in the future. Next slide. So I really like that uh, combination, Haley, of the opportunities and priorities. And I think that suggests that 
you know, what you've shown is that you add a dash of leadership, innovation, and creativity, and you can really have some positive results. And so I'll just highlight a couple as examples where I think that leadership and innovation have been really important in accomplishing some really new and important things. On San Francisco Bay, the watershed permit combines 37 individual wastewater utilities in an innovative and cooperatively developed way with nutrient reduction targets and incentives. So some pretty creative stuff. To me, two people really stand out there. Dave Williams, the executive director of BACWA, and Tom Mumley, the permit writer from the California Water Board and the shuttle diplomacy that they did to pull the permit together. And there were many others involved. I mean, David Sin from the San Francisco uh, Estuary Institute, uh, Mike Connor from uh, East Bay Utilities. You know, we've got a lot of people involved there, but these two leaders really stand out and I think they really made something new and innovative happen. Next slide, David. Another example of a collaboration that includes a utility and non-point sources, the Middle Cedar, Cedar River Partnership in Iowa, grassroots watershed planning and advocacy, combination of a utility in the city of Cedar Rapids and a producer organization for agriculture. Steve Hirschner, the utilities director uh, at the city that was preparing their nutrient management plan, Roger Wolf, the director of the Iowa Soybean Association, a producer organization and their collaboration, the Middle Cedar Partnership would not have been possible without Steve and without Roger. So Haley, you wanna wrap up for us? Yeah, I think those are really important closing thoughts. This is an issue that we've been tackling in nutrients uh, for more than a decade, decades now. Um, but really when we're talking about how we, how we get to better outcomes, I believe that any utility can take leadership and make change. And that's not to say that it's easy and often the better, better solutions and better outcomes are not. And it does take some risk to make that transformative change. And there's typically a person at an organization that's at the center of that. But that action then creates movement for all of us and that together we can see better solutions for our watersheds, which is really what these examples highlight, is getting to a point where we're managing, managing the system and we're able to do that in some ways together. Well, Rick, I think that wraps up what we plan to present and uh, we'll see if you've got any questions for us. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Dave and Haley. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one from John uh, Gasick, uh, does effective utility management play any part in integrated planning? Uh, Haley, is that a question for you? Do you, do you understand what uh, John is asking? Um, I wonder if, uh, not specifically, so I might need a little more there, John. <laughs> Well, I think we could say to John that effective utility management would be essential, right? And uh, I think we were trying to suggest that that combination of leadership and creativity to innovate is really key. And if you can combine those things, maybe you can do, maybe you can manage nutrients and these other competing demands in ways that, you know, at face value, you don't think are possible, but we need to do better in nutrient management and consider things in a holistic way. So I think in our talk, we're suggesting those are pretty key things to combine in order to make progress to get beyond where we are right now. Yeah, and I think some of the things that have made, made this harder in the past, integrated planning helps to, to at least streamline or focus the approach to how we can, can do these things and, and make different kind of outcomes or choices within our utilities. Okay. John, John did respond. He's, he's saying that NACWA and EPA have created an EUM program, and he's just wondering about, about that. Well, I think, you know, uh, that builds upon a real focus that NACWA has in, uh, in developing leadership within utilities and for that organization, you know, to exhibit leadership on the issues of the day in the water environment, you know, specifically for wastewater utilities. So it's a real um, advocacy organization that's, uh, that focuses on developing utility managers, but is also uh, perhaps we would say a little more of an advocacy organization than uh, Water Environment Federation, where we're more technically focused. Okay, a question from uh, Tim Hagen at Pierce County. He was wondering if you could talk a little bit about bubble per permitting. Yeah, I can speak to what the city's asking. I think Steve or Dave can provide a, a broader um, framework for what we've seen in the in the country. But we've got 
uh, three facilities right now, we want to have one load, uh, one phosphorus load that we're managing to. And so the way that what we've asked is that our load be equal to that that's in the TMDL for the lower Boise River, but where those pounds are removed within the system, whether at West Boise Lander Street or Dixie Drain is really something that we um, we can control because the overall load that's being removed from the system is the same. Um, and I'll maybe add a step toward a watershed based permit. So which would certainly bring in more facilities, um, but in the bubble permit, at least in our context, it's limited to our, um, our utility and what we control. Dave? Yeah, I think we've got a really nice example there with what Boise City has been pursuing for quite some time. And I think Haley makes a nice, um, uh, suggestion that even going beyond the bubble permit that Tim is asking about the idea of watershed permitting and watershed management is perhaps even stronger and that gets you to this reference we're making to the San Francisco uh, Bay watershed permit but we've got other good examples in the northwest clean water services has long had a combined permit that allows some load sharing between facilities and offsets Nationally, we've got some great examples in Las Vegas on, La on Las Vegas Wash. We've got a bubble permit where there's a shared waste load allocation amongst uh, city of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, Henderson, and uh, um, let's see, Las Vegas, Henderson, and Clark County on ammonia and phosphorus. And then a bubble permit we put together um, with the help of uh, the Minneapolis Met Council uh, that was accepted eventually by MPCA. And this is one that uh, Haley and I worked on years ago. It's very interesting in that we've got five wastewater facilities that the Met Council has that discharge to the upper Mississippi. And when we first talked about doing an umbrella permit is what they call it in, uh, in Minnesota, it was kind of dead on arrival at MPCA. So we provided some examples. And in the end, there was a draft permit issued uh, by MPCA that included a phosphorus bubble for the five uh, Met Council facilities. Uh, there was immediately an appeal of the permit and a lawsuit. And I think the happy ending on that is that the Met Council prevailed and that permit's in effect today. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question that we have in the chat uh, from John Beecham at Post Falls. Uh, what advice do you have for smaller utilities to take advantage of these opportunities? particularly those with a single CWA obligation, uh, one discharge, one permit, and uh, those with limiting, limited staffing. Um, Haley, can I start on that one? I mean, I think a couple of things to say in perspective, and I, I know Haley will add on to this from our discussions and putting together presentation. And we were trying to show those examples between the big Johnson County and the smaller Columbia to show that or illustrate that this integrated planning idea, John, it doesn't have to be just a big municipal organization that takes this on. In fact, I think that this EPA framework that has six elements for integrated planning, it's actually relatively simple. And so one of the things that Haley and I have been visiting about is that a lot of utilities will have many of these elements already in some form or another either in their technical work, their facilities planning, their comp plans, that you could probably form a large part of this uh, six part framework for integrated planning. To John's question about maybe being more of a single purpose utility in city post falls, you know, if you're just looking at wastewater, you probably have stormwater, but you still have an ability to use this vehicle as a way to do that adaptive management part and do the affordability analysis to look at the financial planning. What kind of a time period do you need in the city to accomplish things in a way that the customer base can actually bear the costs in consideration of everything locally? So it's local priorities and what you need for a compliance schedule in order to be successful with all the competing demands. Haley, you wanna add on to that? Yeah, I'd probably just add a couple of things, John, that I, I think to Dave's point, we've got as utilities often a lot of the pieces. I think one of the connecting points for integrated planning is having that community outreach and really understanding what the expectations are. That really helps inform them those needs. And, and whether it's affordability or reliability or going above and beyond, any one of those really informs a need for more time and the ability to decide what comes first. And I also think that having that maybe a much more tactical response would be having the initial conversations with the regulatory agencies. We've got the structure in, in place federally. We're starting to see some action. 
that's, that piece of it in those conversations will really be utility driven in order to see and get those incorporated, whether by permit, by letter, by annual get together and description of what activities are going to happen in the next year. Um, but that really, that piece of it, the conversation between the utilities and, and in our case, DEQ will be driven by, um, will be driven by us. Okay. Well, thanks, Dave and Haley. Uh, we're pretty much at the end of our time for this Q&A. There are a few more questions, and if you could just direct them uh, straight to Dave uh, or Haley, uh, that would be great. I'm sure they'll give you your contact information, or you can stick around for the uh, 1230 Q&A session that we'll have after this. Uh, just a reminder, I know that the polls, sometimes they're not popping up for folks. Uh, one of the things that we found out is that if you're in full screen mode, those polls don't necessarily pop up for the CEUs. So uh, if you're having problems with that, just let us know and, and we'll make sure to get your credits. Uh, and we're gonna take a quick uh, couple minute break and join us for the next session on nitrogen removal technologies with Dr. Raj Chauvin. Thanks. <laughs>